Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first story is titled, Lady said her child needed to go to the hospital. I am an RN. A few years ago, I was working at a walk-in clinic in the middle of downtown in a large Canadian city. Now, as a walk-in clinic nurse, I am used to a lot of entitlement from patients, those who believe that they can jump the line of other people who have been waiting five plus hours to see the doctor simply because their symptoms are more important, those that don't understand that when we say that we have closed registration early in order to be able to close at our official time of 9.30pm it means that they can't be seen even if it is only 8pm when they come in, those that have become verbally, physically, and sexually abusive towards me if they don't get their way. A lot of the doctors that worked with me seemed to have a lot when faced with patients IR. So if I told the patients that they couldn't be seen due to the clinic policy of wanting its employees to actually get sleep before having to come back in the next morning, they would attempt to go around me and appeal to the doctor who would inevitably cave. This angered me on a lot of levels. Firstly, these doctors were simply rewarding this disgustingly selfish behavior by capitulating. Secondly, they were lending credence to the belief that a lot of patients had, I was a mere subordinate to the doctor and not my own autonomous practitioner. Thirdly, I was nurse manager of this clinic. The doctors were on call at the behest of the clinic and as such, did not technically have authority upon our hours as nursing staff and receptionists. Fourthly, we are supposed to act as a united team. So one particularly trying night, a lady came in with her toddler child. She came in at around 8.45, and we still had another two hours of people waiting to be seen. We had closed registration at 6 p.m. and were not accepting any new patients. I am in the back of the clinic performing a wound cleaning when the receptionist calls me and asks me to come up front as there is an aggressive patient demanding their child to be seen. So I head out to the front. The lady is standing at the desk, arms folded, snapping at her child to sit still. I glance at the child, who is sitting on a chair, swinging their legs and babbling away happily to anyone who will listen. Eyes bright, smiling, laughing. Doesn't look unwell, I think to myself as a cursory assessment. As soon as the lady sees me with my stethoscope, she launches her tirade. Doctor, my child is extremely unwell. She has asthma and can barely breathe. She needs to be seen immediately. I glance deadpan back at the child who is singing loudly to herself. I look back to the lady. She doesn't seem to be in distress, ma'am. The lady tenses up and stares at me as though I am a complete ducking moron. Well where the hell did you go to medical school? She inquires with the auditory level of banshee. Kids present very differently than adults when they can't breathe. What are you, 12? I walk over to the child and place my hand gently on her back. I count her respirations as she falls quiet under my touch and I observe her scapulae as they expand and contract, indicating full chest expansion. I listen to the smooth sounds of her inspiration and expiration audible even without a stethoscope. I observe the moistness of her conjunctivae as she rubs her eyes, and I see the glistening wetness of her tongue as she licks her lips. She's well hydrated. I'm not a doctor, I am a nurse, I say, as I plug my stethoscope into my ears and begin to listen to the child's lung fields. Of course you don't know what you're doing. She yells. I didn't bring my ill child to see some stupid nurse, I demand to see a doctor. Now. She needs to go to the hospital and if she gets worse, I'll have your license. Child's lung sounds are perfect. I lean down and smile at the child. How are you feeling? I ask her. She wants my stethoscope. I hand it to her. I'm bored, she says, understandably. I look to the lady. Registration closed some time ago because as you can see, we have many patients to see and will end up being here past closing. I am afraid that we cannot see your child today. Based on my physical assessment, I cannot triage her up the line as she does not seem to be in respiratory distress. There are several hospitals close by that I can direct you to, if you wish. A slow purple flush begins to crawl over her features. I smile blandly at her as I await the inevitable crap storm about to erupt. She walks up to me and leans into my face. I stand my ground, staring noncommittally back. The rest of the waiting room is staring intently. Get. The. Ducking. Doctor. 
The doctor is seeing patients, ma'am. I cannot interrupt him. My child is going to die because of you, you disgusting, low-educated, P-E-I-C-E of filth. G-E-T-T-H-E-D-U-C-K-I-N-G-D-O-C-T-O-R. I am about to repeat my previous statement when I suddenly hear a slight cough behind me. It's the doctor. Internally, I sag. Great. He's going to usher them in, and I get to look like an idiot in front of everyone again. What seems to be the problem? He asks, staring quizzically at the lady. She rushes over to him and clings to his arm. Oh, thank God, doctor. My child. She has asthma. She has run out of her puffers and is in an attack. This, nurse, refused to let her see you. The doctor stands there, resolute, and disentangles his arm from her vice grip. He takes a cursory glance at the child who has begun delightedly listening to her own stomach with my stethoscope. He then walks over to me. Now this is a doctor whom I have not met before tonight. I prepare for the worst. Nurse. I assumed you performed triage. I nod. Yes, I say. I do not see any evidence of respiratory distress. Lung sounds. Non-adventitious. I say. Fancy way of saying clear as duck. Mucous membranes. Fancy way of asking about hydration status. Pink, moist. Capillary refill? Fancy way of asking about blood flow. Immediate. The doctor turns towards the lady. And this is when I realize that he has been watching this entire exchange from the beginning. I am calling you an ambulance. The lady blinks. What? Why? You said that she needed to go to the hospital. If that is what you think, you know your child better than I do. I'd rather be safe than sorry. The lady looks nonplussed. But dot but dot the nurse said that she isn't in distress. The doctor smiles humorlessly. What this nurse right here? The one you were accusing of negligence and lack of knowledge? I trust this nurse's assessments. She has been very perceptive and professional for the long night that I have had the fortune to work with her. However, she, like myself, cannot know the intricacies of your child's history. It would be negligence indeed if we were to dismiss your concerns as a parent. Nurse, please call the ambulance. Unable to keep the crap-eating grin off of my face, I walk to the phone. The lady is trying to argue with the doctor who is walking away. Best of luck to you, ma'am. I am sorry that you have had to wait so long, but it's best that we leave this to the professionals, hm? And a shame it is, too, as this is flu season and all of the emergency departments are full to bursting with people waiting to be seen. Prepare for a very long wait. And with that, he returned to the examination rooms. I hung up after exiting the call with M's. The lady was visibly shaking. A few smiles littered the faces of those watching. M's should be here shortly. If your child's status worsens, please have my receptionist call me back out. Have a good night, ma'am. Vindication has never felt so sweet. The next story is titled, I'm not allowed to shoot back at night snipers in Vietnam, but I am allowed to launch a flare to illuminate the situation? Okay. This is a story from my father, who was an American grunt in the Vietnam War. This was during one of his assignments in, near a Vietnamese village. Because they were trying to avoid killing the local civilians they had orders expressly prohibiting them from shooting back, maybe just at night, and the guerrillas knew about it. So every single night the guerrillas would climb up on rooftops in the village and take pot shots at my father's group. Now, because the guerrillas were effectively using the civilians as a shield, the men weren't allowed to shoot back. They were, however, allowed to launch a flare, which would light things up enough that the guerrillas didn't feel safe continuing to shoot at them. But the shooting would start back up again the next night. One night my father had had enough, and he had a devious idea. When a sniper started taking pot shots that night, he immediately launched a flare. Horizontally. Right at the sniper. His commanding officer reamed him for it, but after that the nighttime pot shots stopped. The next story is titled, Expect me to treat kids like crap, I'm going to shut down your daycare. So this happened a number of years ago when I was in college studying preschool education. A new daycare had recently opened in our town and it already had a bit of an unsavory reputation. For some reason they had gotten my name from one of my professors as a potential supply teacher, whatever but okay. Closing parenthesis. Cue a call from them at 6.30am on the hottest day of summer. 
I kid you not it had to be 30 C at 7 AM and the temp was still rising. The director was in a twist needing a supply for a few days and promised to pay me $10 an hour if I came in to pinch hit. What college student doesn't need money haha ha, so I agreed and headed on over. I got there about 8 AM and the place was disgusting. Dirty floors, filthy walls, broken toys. It looked like the school from the movie Matilda. I barely had time to take in the nastiness around me when I heard a woman screaming in the kitchen, eat damn you. And the sound of a very young baby wailing. I scooted to the kitchen as was met with absolute filth. Dirty dishes piled on the counter. Crusted pots filled with something in the sink, dot and flies. Oh the flies. Sadly that wasn't the worst of it because sitting in a battered high chair was a crying baby with an enraged adult teacher I assume trying to force a spoonful of oatmeal into his tiny mouth. Me, what are you doing? Teacher, little brat won't eat. Eat damn you. I shoved her aside, got him calmed down, and gave him his cereal. Q ticked off teacher who was apparently offended that a stupid supply knew how to get a baby to eat. Gasp. As I was finishing up with JR, the director came into the kitchen and announced my class for the day would be the school age kids. Upstairs. I made my way up the stairs and the heat met me about halfway to the top. It was a sauna. Easily 45 C up there. Director oh yeah the AC broke three weeks ago we haven't gotten it fixed yet. I looked around at the three almost bare rooms on the upper floor. In one was a TV with a video game console and two controllers. In another was some old board games and the third had a shelf with some battered books on it. With this, I was expected to entertain 15 children for the next 8 hours. Fast forward to early afternoon. I have opened every window and the door to the fire escape hoping to get some cross breeze going. The kids are hot and bored. Thank goodness they each brought their own lunch because no way was I going to feed them whatever came crawling out of that kitchen. I had asked the director if the kids and I might go down to the backyard where there was shade and was told firmly no, we had to stay upstairs in the inferno the entire day. Cue malicious compliance. Done done done. I was sitting out on the fire escape with several of the kids, playing a game when a very smartly dressed woman walked out and introduced herself as Mrs. Blah from social services. Did I have a few moments to talk to her? Oh did I have a few moments? Come pull up a milk crate. Let's chat shall we? I told her everything. The dirt, the flies, the teacher screaming at the baby, the broken AC and refusal of letting the kids go downstairs to try to prevent heat stroke. And the cream on the cake. I had not yet gotten my degree in preschool teaching. I was an unlicensed, unsupervised college student in charge of 15 kids. Apparently the staff had refused to talk to her at all so she and I had a lovely conversation for the next half hour and it didn't take the kids long to realize this was their chance for their own bit of revenge as they pipped up with their own stories and complaints. The daycare was shut down the next day. I was never paid but honestly just getting them closed down was payment enough for me. The next story is titled, Dapper Dan Fails to Think Things Through. I graduated uni a few years back and immediately started looking for a job in my chosen field, marketing. Marketing entry level roles were thin on the ground, so when I found a role which was hybrid of marketing with sales support, I took it. The company was a medium sized business which specialized in recruitment, contractor hiring and head hunting. They also subcontracted work for a recruitment technology provider, which matched up perfectly with one of my other passions, technology. I absolutely loved the role. I got to do all parts of the marketing and sales life cycle, I got to work with suppliers, event organizers, clients, staff all across the company, meet new people and do really exciting things. I had two managers, the one who managed the sales team and the one who managed marketing. The marketing manager was a kindred spirit, the sales manager was old school sales. An arrogant and headstrong late 40s man who lived for making deals and boasting about them. Shiny shoed, silver tongued. I'll call him Dapper Dan. We were not friends. For about 18 months, things went swimmingly. I'd do marketing half the time then divide the rest of the time between sales support and billable work. Billable was building custom careers, job sites to host the recruitment system front end. A steep learning curve but with the help of some web dev friends I got pretty familiar with simple site builds. 
Being tech aligned meant I was always looking digital first, bringing the company into the age of social media, SEO, SEM, website optimization and multi-channel marketing. Dapper Dan sneered at such things. He saw digital as a waste of money. However, we were always able to justify the spend on digital by offsetting the billable website work. The marketing manager eventually moved on to bigger and better things. Rather than promote me or hire in a replacement, the company moved the marketing responsibilities to Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan's changes were immediate and far-reaching. He removed the digital budget. He required that 50% of my time would be sales support to better enable the sales team. He incorporated the billable work with his own team's revenue. He rewrote my annual objectives to align purely with sales targets rather than marketing. When I voiced my objections, he took me aside for a friendly chat and told me if I didn't like it, I could always leave. Naturally, I went and complained extensively to the departed marketing manager over drinks. After listening sympathetically for 45 minutes, she held up a hand, said stop and shared some life advice. Each job pays you twice. You get your money now, that's your wage. You also get experience now, that's how you get paid in the future. So, are you still getting paid? Yes. Are you still learning? No. Figure out how to keep learning, or leave. Taking the advice to heart, I busted my ass for the next year. I worked on digital outside of office hours. I made friends with the tech providers support and dev teams. I went to developer group meetups, attended conferences, studied for and acquired industry qualifications. I joined the National Marketers and Digital Marketers Group. I dug through blogs, articles, emailed people, took every opportunity to cross-skill, upskill, to learn. And I sat with a smile on my face in the sales meetings as Dapper Dan delegated dumb do work to me so his team of sycophants could make the company's growth figures look spectacular. Spectacular they were, to the point that the company was acquired, and Dapper Dan betrayed me. You see, managers have the discretion to assign a pool of shares to high-performing staff. The shares have no real value and can't be traded, but in the event of a management buyout, they would suddenly have value, and quite a lot of value. Dapper Dan felt it appropriate to reward every salesperson in his team with a generous parcel of shares. As a support person, I would not be the beneficiary of such kindness. I'd had a verbal agreement with the previous marketing manager that the pool would be shared across the entire team so was pretty shocked to discover I'd been excluded from the pool. I queried him on it, per the previous agreement, and he said, verbatim, well, and verbal agreement is only worth the paper it's written on. You don't make any sales, you haven't built the business, you don't get a cut. If you didn't like it, he reiterated, you're welcome to leave. That is exactly what I decided to do. Except I didn't tell him. The way the contract handover works in this instance is that all staff cease employment with company X on one day. The following day, they commence employment with company Y annual leave is paid out and begins to re-accrue at the new employer. Other arrangements, salaries, long service leave and length of service, may be transferred to the new employer. About six weeks before the handover, Dapper Dan passed me my new contract. I waited a week, came back with some enthusiastic queries on the new benefits, which took him two weeks to follow up. I quietly registered a domain name and parked it, then spun up a WordPress instance and started building a personal blog. Three weeks away from drop date, everyone's frantically running around getting all the deals as close as possible to closing and employment contracts are the last thing on his mind. I go back to him, I tell him I have a couple more things I need to check out and I'll email them through to him before I sign it. I spend a few more nights throwing together a bunch of blog articles relating to recruitment technology. How to articles, that kind of stuff, many of my own installation notes. A week passes, I fire off a couple of really complex questions around the transfer of benefits. He obviously forgets about them, then in the week of the handover, catches heat from the HR team about the outstanding contract and pulls me into a meeting room to berate me about not having signed the new contract. I explain I'm waiting on his feedback on those specific points before I'll commit, that I don't want to be disadvantaged moving into the new role, call out the lack of a share option as an example. Clearly frustrated, he drops the words I've been waiting for. If the signed contract is not on my desk on Friday, don't bother coming into the office Monday. He paused for dramatic effect, and reiterated, I mean it. You won't have a job. I replied that I completely understand and that I'll have everything he needs on his desk by close of business Friday. 
On Friday afternoon, Dapper Dan leaves the office early to attend his normal client networking visits which typically involve long lunches and alcohol. At 4.45 p.m. I save the final set of forecasting and reporting to the share drive, send an email to the IT team passing over access to the marketing LastPass account which contains the global database of usernames and passwords for all digital assets including client sites, an Excel workbook containing my reporting macros and the location of all my documentation. I redirect my phone to Dapper Dan's desk number, lock my laptop and leave it on his desk along with my ID card. Over the weekend I push my personal website live and add my contact details to my LinkedIn profile, switching it to actively searching mode. I figure my holiday pay will cover me for a couple of weeks of downtime before I have to go diving back into the workforce. On Monday, I'm enjoying a long walk in the spring sunshine with my dog, who's incredibly happy that his human has not disappeared down the driveway at 0720 per normal. We stop for coffee at a local cafe and my phone begins to ring. It's one of the sales drones at Old Company, I ignore it and thoroughly enjoy the freedom of being able to amble through a park without anywhere to be. The phone buzzes another 8 or 10 times by the time I get home. The poop has well and truly hit the windmill. I check my voicemails, ignoring those I know from my previous employer and returning the phone calls of two ex-clients to let them know that my contract has ended and to check in with Dapper Dan for work in progress, or contact the technology provider for support requests. Shortly afterwards I got a call from a bemused contact who works at the technology provider who's been fielding support calls that I'd normally handle. He listens with increasing interest as I explained the situation, then tells me he'd call back shortly. Ten minutes later he's back with the head of product on the line, asking about my lunch preferences. She arranges to meet me at a nearby Thai place. Over a delicious red duck curry, she cheerfully describes the wonders of a career as a contractor. She also mentions the day rates for highly qualified, industry certified staff, mentioned that tech provider were really struggling to find such staff and gives me the number of a recruiter who may or may not have been on tech supplier's preferred supplier list. I call the recruiter on the way home. Meanwhile, my collection of voicemails from Dapper Dan was growing by the hour as he came to grips with the breadth of the problem that he'd generated. At some point in the late afternoon, HR must have clicked to what had happened and I received a polite SMS from the personal number of the regional HR directory asking if I was available for a quick chat. I called through and discussed the options presented to me by Dapper Dan on Friday, and that I felt I had no option but to follow his instructions. They probed for more information and it became apparent they were unaware that Dapper Dan had pulled an ultimatum without first engaging our. They then informed me that to benefit from the sale of my shares, I would need to transfer to the new company and remain in their employment for a full year. When I explained that I had no such share options, there was a full four second silence. It transpires that this, too, was not adequately communicated to our. I mentioned that I'd appreciate it if Dapper Dan could discontinue his voicemails to me as I found them unprofessional and had no intent of recommencing employment under his management. We ended the call politely, I wished them all the best and regretted the conversation had to happen under such circumstances. My contract for tech provider came through via the PSL agency at 11pm that evening and was signed and returned the following day. I was deployed to client site that Wednesday. Post departure I met up with one of the old IT team at a conference three months after it all went down. He was ecstatic to fill me in on what had happened. The first notice anyone got of it was the service desk asking who they should route my last pass account to and why I'd be passing it around. One of the techs came up to my floor to find me, then found an empty desk. Asked around for where I'd moved to and no one knew. That was the first call, from one of the sales drones trying to locate me. The tech went to Dapper Dan's desk and found my laptop with my ID and post-it note taped to it. He put two and two together, went back downstairs and checked the access logs and realized the last time I'd logged in was Friday. He then locked my account for security purposes and went to HR to check if there was a lever form. HR checks, no lever form and a great big red cross next to, employment contract received. HR calls Dapper Dan, who's not in the office. Dapper Dan says, no, contract should be on my desk, it was on there on Friday, I'm out on the road at the moment, give me till lunch time and I'll sort it out. Obviously thinking that I'm grandstanding. Starts to call me and leave messages then gets progressively agitated as he realizes I'm not coming back. 
When he gets into the office, he can't find the contract either so he goes to HR and explains what has happened, says I have been stonewalling him and it's cool, he'll get it sorted, it's between me and him. HR says erm, um, no, this is our thing now, and the HRD sends me the SMS. Shortly after my phone conversation the HRD walks into a sales meeting and very abruptly pulls Dapper Dan out. They disappear into a meeting room where it may only be assumed that Dapper Dan was required to spell out exactly what had occurred and address the comments that I had made. I suspect he came completely clean at that stage. Dapper Dan was subsequently reamed as only HR and senior management can ream a manager who's ducked up. He was demoted, decoupled from marketing, his budget reduced by half and a new, separate marketing function created. His team were collectively put under review and forced to carry out their own reporting, tracking and metrics, which lacked the coherence and consistency that I'd been able to deliver. This reduced the capacity of the team. A couple of them left and they missed out on some key deals. In the fallout they completely dropped the ball on the client website builds. They went to market to try and find a resource who could fulfill these builds, and Dapper Dan was reportedly astounded to discover that experienced technical marketing staff are both hard to find and expensive to recruit. They were unable to fill the role and the builds were taken back in-house by the tech provider, who now had an experienced resource to deploy me. I ended up working on three of these at full utilization rate, which was paid by the new company. I'm pretty sure Dapper Dan would have seen the funding arrangements for these and would know my day rate, which is substantially higher than his. Much later as the sales lead, Dapper Dan had to bear the displeasure of his superiors for the full 12 months before he could claim his share payout. It would have been a really, really crappy 12 months for him. He resigned within two weeks of the anniversary of the purchase, and the company enforced a six-month notice period and another 12-month no-compete clause. Any benefit he would have received from the share payout would have been consumed over that 12 months unless he switched industries or moved cities. Last time I saw he was on the job market. As for me? Happily living the life of the contractor. I get paid for the hours I work and I work the hours I want. My old marketing manager is now VP of something at a large multinational. I've used her speech several times when giving young, frustrated staff career advice. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel and post some bear emojis in the comment.